I was living my dream, but then everything changed. Well, what about that for a break from Burton? When it's an Olympic athlete having a tantrum, it's different to a three-year-old having a tantrum. You are thrown around like a rag doll. Abby Burton, all physicality. They took the knives away because they just didn't know what I was going to do. She just seemed really down, really sort of withdrawn. It was just hard because you knew she wasn't her. For a minute or five minutes, your life stands still. It's probably one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever had to do, walk away from it. Growing up in the Burton household was manic. Uh, we were always on the go. There wasn't a day goes by where I wasn't either tackled to the floor or a rugby ball whizzing past my head. That, that light got smashed so many times, you can see it, actually. Yeah, it's still broken. It's still broken. As a kid, I was really, really sporty. I basically got involved in any sport I possibly could. She got to the nationals at swimming. Then she started with athletics, javelin, discus but there was just something about rugby that I was like, no, I want to do that. She played a game for St Wilfred's. She put a bag down on the floor and she looked at me, I'll never forget the glint in her eye. She went, I loved it. Playing rugby empowered me. Abby Burton enters the fray. I debuted 2018 in Glendale. Throughout the whole of that season, I was the only player to play on every single World Series stop. To do that as such a young player as well was, was really great to see. So she, and from that moment, she just kept growing and growing as, as her career progressed. The day she found out she'd been picked for the Olympics, she just, she fell to the floor, didn't she? Screamed, yeah. And then she was crying, we were all crying. One of the happiest moments that I've ever experienced in my entire life, and I saw my mum and dad just stood in the kitchen, just hugging each other. And I think that for them, it was kind of a moment of like, she's actually done it. I was living my dream, but then everything changed. My last real proper memory of playing rugby is probably in Langford. I remember that tournament really, really clearly. Remember the try that I scored, because I don't usually score a lot of tries. Burton, fresh legs off the bench, fresh damage, fresh score for England. <laughs> Just after Langford going into May, my memory just kind of starts to get a little bit hazy. I very much thought there was a performance issue to start with, that she was a bit off the pace. And that was kind of the first sign for me that something wasn't quite right. We all started noticing differences. She just seemed really down, really sort of withdrawn from the group. People say to me that I was just really sad, like I was looking straight through people. I wasn't very receptive. I had kind of no emotion at all, which is completely not like me. The thing that was scary is that she just couldn't put her finger on it. She was just so confused as to why she was feeling how she was feeling. It was just hard because you knew she wasn't her. And all I wanted to do was like hug her and be like, we've got you, like we're here. Like it doesn't matter what it is, like we'll fix it. And that's when I got referred to our psychologist. There was potential of, or I think we think that she's got depression. And then that's kind of then when everything started to become like a domino effect. For three months, I have no memory at all. I was sat with her one morning. Whilst I was talking to her, she put her hand on her chest and she went, <gasps> Mum. And then her eyes rolled back and she just started to have this massive fit. If you ever see anybody have a seizure, especially somebody you love, it is horrific because you cannot do anything to stop it. For a minute or five minutes, your life stands still. And it was after that that it kind of triggered this really. It started to then progressively get really, really... Manic, yeah. aggressive yeah. behaviour, and she quite clearly didn't know what she was doing. My body went into fight or flight. It was really aggressive towards my parents. She ripped banister to pieces. She grabbed two of them spindles, pulled it off in one go. I punched my mum in the face. I could never imagine doing that right now. I was trying to get out the house unclothed. I was trying to sprint up and down our garden to like get away from my dad. We ended up in a full on fight. It was scary. Um, it was a full time job, wasn't it? They took the knives away because they just didn't know what I was going to do. Dan said to me, he said, I, I, can't, I can't control her anymore I'm bit on my own. I need some help. The home treatment team had come to see her and, and they said we'd have to get her assessed to see if she was 
fit to stay at home or she needed to go to a psychiatric hospital. They decided from that that she needed to go to Fieldhead and put her under a section too. So we, uh, we knew that if we didn't take her, then somebody else would take her. So it's probably one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever had to do, walk away from her. She had a lot of tests done and the doctors just said she's got stress-induced psychosis. In the period of her early admission, I was probably on the phone most days, just trying to support and just trying to work out what was going on. This guy approached me to so say, I do uh, clinical research, and, and I think what she's got is something physical. And they came and took blood from her, sent it off, and it came back as autoimmune encephalitis. Encephalitis is uh, inflammation of the brain. In this case, it's an autoimmune condition where you have uh, antibodies that the body produces itself to its own receptors which sit on the brain. And when that happens, it creates a lot of inflammation and therefore dysfunction of the brain. So we felt relieved, but then when you Googled it, you're like, oh, yeah, this yeah. ain't great, this. You, you die from that. It's a very, very rare condition. Abby is the very first patient I have ever had who has been diagnosed with this condition. The people with this condition regress into childlike and they can have massive tantrums. And when it's an Olympic athlete having a tantrum, it's different to a three-year-old having a tantrum. You are thrown around like a rag doll. She'd thrown a few people out of the way. So I had her on the floor, holding her, cradling her head while she was screaming, kicking. And um, they said that she'd have to, uh, she'd have to go into a, a coma. Um, so they could manage that part of her. You kind of know that if you go into a coma, that you, there's a real possible chance that you're just not going to wake up. That was a Friday. They originally said to us, we're going to wake her up again on Tuesday. That four days became three and a half weeks. In Abby's case, because she had been so affected and so debilitated with this condition, she needed treatment in intensive care. Over this time, I had seven plasma exchanges. I was on like a heavy dose of steroids. One form, form of chemotherapy while I was asleep, they knew that if they didn't treat it so aggressively, then things could have turned out very differently. The main memory that I have of when I woke up was the first time I saw my mum and dad. And they came into the room at the ICU and they just both held my hands. And we, all three of us just cried. One of the first conversations she had with me, she said, did I miss the Commonwealth? And I said, you did. She said, how did the girls do? So I told her. And she said to me, I can get myself to the World Cup next month. <laughs> I don't think she actually acknowledged she couldn't walk at this point. Yeah. She'd lost an incredible amount of weight. And because of the inflammation around the brain, she was still having difficulty with executive functioning. She could talk, but not talk properly. And she couldn't swallow, she couldn't write. We were able to pull a team of people together around her to support her physical conditioning, some physiotherapy input, and then she was getting neurocognitive support, which was organised by Pinderfield. No sidestep. No sidestepping. The staff at Pinderfields were absolutely incredible. Hello. <laughs> I cannot appreciate them enough. Hello. How good, thank you. Her recovery has been very much an extension of what she's like in normal life. As soon as she comes back from the hospital, she's, right, this is what I want to do. She's doing really, really well. Way ahead of schedule. Having Abby back at training has been incredible. It's great to see her smile back and bouncing around training. She's that bit of energy that, that you sort of need on, on day one of camp. It's just so amazing that she's now back lifting heavier than ever. She's back passing the ball around and it won't be long now until she's back playing on the World Series. It's just given me a whole new appreciation of life and appreciation of the people that I have around me. I've missed you. I appreciate you. I'm just so proud of her for, for getting through this. She has literally faced it all and nothing's ever held her back. She doesn't have any limits on what she's capable of. That tenacity, I think it's what makes her an excellent athlete, is what's allowed her to get through this journey as quickly but as impressively as she has. She's very driven and, and has her goals firmly set in her head. Hopefully the future involves me playing on the series, but also an Olympics next season. <laughs>